Perfect. Hey, Jersey. Hey, Rob. So, how's, how's my guy? <laughs> how's my guy? <laughs> thought, I'd, thought I'd start a little bombastic this time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Uncle Jersey, Uncle Jersey. Oh, God, no, not that one. <laughs> Bring it. Cool from your latest uh, adventures? Home? Huh? Oh, you're talking about the sink? No, whatever. Oh, I guess, yeah. Come no, we think. don't talk about that. No, I was playing out the metaphor of, uh, you know. Oh, like Uncle Traveling Matt from Fraggle Where's Rock kind of deal? Patriarch kind of thing. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, I don't ever want to be a patriarch. Oh, man. That, that's like a total, that's almost a curveball that you threw at me. It's like, that's a whole other thing. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, the role of um, being a teacher. And do you want to be the teacher who's the, uh, the patriarch? Or do you want to be the teacher who's like the partner? Right? The, the, the person who's there along for the ride with you. Right? Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't, I, oh, you know, I know I'm getting old. I mean, I just got my hair cut and I noticed how, how gray I'm getting, you know, and it's, it's probably another couple of years and it'll all be gray. Uh, so I, I, I can't avoid people feeling that way about me. Uh, like it or not, it's going to happen. You know, the young people are going to look up to me like that because of the whole look and being old. But yeah, but if you're happy and gray, you're kind of timeless like Steve Martin. Oh, wow. Wow, I like that. <laughs> oh, I, I, that made me feel a lot better. Cool. So, <laughs> I mean, he's been gray since like the 70s. That's true. Since he was probably, yeah, a little younger than me. Yeah. So, um, hey, I have, I have an observation to throw in. It's not exactly a curveball, but it's an observation from one of my classrooms. And I don't know if this will be interesting to people who listen to Lean into Art or not. But, but we uh, like observations. So what you well, got? It, it's... Uh, so I'm doing this, this, this class now where these kids are uh, working towards a fictional intellectual property, each in their own way, right? They're building a comic based on it. I chronicled this in, what was it in? Was it in uh, Fabulous Secrets I talked about this, I think? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was Fabulous yeah. Secrets. Um, episode four, four, I think. Four, yeah. Something to show for it, I think, was the, the title of the episode. Uh, so the premise is that uh, the, I, I present them with a fake... A pretend intellectual property that a corporation wants to turn into a profitable cartoon slash toy slash comic series, and they're all inv- they're all uh, elected to pitch a comic series and build a comic series around this this fake intellectual property. And the, the idea was very basic. It was it's called the Rainbow Buddies. It in- incorporates five heroes or main characters who either protect or save the world. There's a distinction between those two wor- uh, words, and uh, it has to incorporate primary colors in the story in some way, right? And then the, and the, these kids are super smart because they said, like, well, what do you mean by primary? You mean primary pigment or primary light? And I was like, ah, good question. Let's do both, right? Um, or either, right? And uh, not, not only are the kids, like, really doing great stuff, like, th- this last week, this week's assignment was they had to pitch their idea. They, they, the first week was design your characters, come up with your premise, build your world. Week two, now you got to pitch it to the group. And these kids are all interacting with one another, like it, offering each other advice and support and insights. Like, well, what if you did this with that? What if you did this with that? But there's a couple of kids in the class who are homeschooled. And uh, I don't know how most people feel about homeschooling, but it gets a bad rap sometimes. It gets made fun of. It gets picked on a lot. Uh, but I'm noticing from my own anecdotal experience, I work with a lot of different homeschool kids in the Ann Arbor area. And when they're homeschooled and the parents are really plugged in and they're the kind of parents who take them to the library and check out like 40 books on a subject and work with the kids on the subject, that kind of homeschool parent. Sure. There was a a 12 year old girl in my class who presented as well as I would say as a 20 year old. Like her presentation style was so good and she was so clear in her thinking and, and her ideas were so well developed and she was so at ease with talking to a group of people. Whereas 12, 13 year olds, right? You, you imagine them, they do the whole, uh, this is my guy and he does a thing and he kind of is like mean and this guy's kind of nice, right? Like that's what you normally expect from that age group and that's what I see a lot. But this kid stood up there and she, and she was just... It, it was amazing. It was it was a, a brilliant presentation that she gave to the class, and I had very little insight to offer her on her story. All I could say was, "Keep going with that. That's great." <laughs> <laughs> and I and I think it, a lot of it came out of like the fact that she was so at ease in in a group, and I and and so at ease talking to an adult, and so not worried about me saying, "Oh, that's wrong, right? Oh, you got to work on that. That that's a bad thing you did there. You got to make it better." 
uh, she was, she, and, and what's more is she was very receptive to input. And when I was giving her input, she was like, oh, yeah, I hadn't considered that. That's really good. To hear a 12-year-old talk that, that clearly and that confidently is really astonishing. And so I got nothing but mad props for the people who homeschool uh, if, they're, if, they, if they get engaged with their kids because you wind up producing kids who are, who are as confident as a well-developed adult. Well, I imagine a lot of it is going at the, the pace that's comfortable for, it's so individualized, I would guess, right? So yeah. one, I would imagine that that girl was, uh, um, she's probably pretty used to, to um, almost uh, just demanding with a large appetite for information and interesting projects, and that just probably would feed on itself. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I can identify in that uh, maybe that kicked in in my 30s. <laughs> yeah. It was the same way for me. I was like 27. I started to get that way. So to see a 12 year old do that, I was like, gosh, I, I'm, she's going to rule the world someday. You know, that, that's, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Super cool. So anyway, well, what that was it. I mean, the patriarchal angle is that the, the whole, uh, you don't think if, like if you wanted to be her patriarch and, and try to impose or, or your stamp of approval on her, I, I, would you even think that would work with someone like that? I mean, no, I think I think that she would be confused by it. I, I get the sense that she would feel like, well, why are you trying to take over my thing? This is my thing, right? <laughs> That's so cool. She needs to be uh, shipped around then. <clears throat> Have her be like a plant in classrooms. Oh, well, well what I think I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to... As, as, well, as I work with this, these kids, I'm going. The other thing I'm doing, um, actually, this is I can do like a little newsy thing. Um, next week, the 18th of October, yeah. uh, I'm doing a special episode of Comics Are Great. There's going to be two episodes next week because uh, I'm doing a panel discussion at the Ann Arbor District Library called Teens Make Comics, and it's going to be a group of kids who I've worked with over the years who have all made and self-published their own comics before the age of 18, and these are all kids who are really good at talking about their stuff and. Um, so as, as, I, as I meet more of these kids in my classrooms, I start developing some kind of like a, oh, I don't want to say relationship because that might sound uh, creepy to some people. But I, I start a rapport with them where I get them involved in my uh, public outreach projects. Like I have them table at Kids Read Comics. I have them come on my podcasts because it's a way to help promote their work, them as a, as a person, get them more comfortable with more public speaking and with self-promotion. So it, it's, it's to benefit them, but it also benefits the general uh, project I'm trying to do in Ann Arbor is like elevating the status of comics by showing that look at what it does for these kids. Look at these well-spoken, well-rounded kids who are expressing themselves cr creatively through our medium. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, she will... I, I got a feeling after this first couple weeks, uh, I'm going to be working more with this kid in a lot of my public projects. <laughs> she's, she's too good a resource to let slide, you know? Uh, but anyway, you know, it's like it's, it's, it's amazing how much a uh, little self-confidence can do for somebody. Right. And, and, and that's something that creative people often, that's one of the number one things they struggle with, is that sense of self-confidence to be able to assert their ideas in, in, in a way that is receptive to criticism and input, but they don't let that filter down into a judgment about them as a person. Right. Yeah, so <laughs> anyway, <laughs> another, another uh, anecdote from the classroom is, uh, again, I, I don't know where this is coming from. I'm guessing this is coming from listening to a lot of Merlin Mann as I'm using the, the terminology, oh, do the thing, go get the thing. And uh, <laughs> I was I was using an, I was um, using an analogy uh, for building a point in my classroom about how storytelling works, and I was trying to explain what a theme is to my classroom. And yes, I use Star Wars, but that's and, and that is the storytelling teacher's sort of um, you know knock knock joke. <laughs> it's it's the easy it's the easy cheap and kind of corny analogy to use is to mention Star Wars to, to build to illustrate a storytelling point. But I said like what's mythology. What's that? It's a familiar mythology, so... Yeah, you, know. you got to use what a lot of people know about, right, if you're going to make an analogy. I'm, so um, let me ask you then, do you do this um, in your normal clothes or in a Boba Fett costume? <laughs> it's my slave Leia gear that I wear. That, that's, okay. that's a great attention getter. Yeah, that would be um, the odd part, but yeah. <laughs> Common mythology? No, nah, not, not weird. <laughs> Leg on my side. Uh, no, but I, I was trying to expl explain what a theme was to these kids, and I said, you know, like, oh, what's the theme of Star Wars? 
and the kid says, uh, oh, space battles. I'm like, ah, oh, that's, that's premise, that's detail, that's surface feature. What's the big idea? What's the message? What's the purpose? What's the point of Star Wars? And they're really, they're, they're crunching on it. And so I said, <laughs> I, was, I decided to use the trench battle from A New Hope to make this point. And here's where the joke comes in, is that I, I say, so you know that part where Luke Skywalker's in the spaceship, he's going through the trench, and he's got to shoot the thing and the thing, and then all of a sudden the, like, uh, he puts up his computer to shoot the thing and the thing, and then Obi or this ghost of this old man says, hey, you don't need the machine to put the thing and the thing, you just need to use your own inner, inner uh, voice to put the thing and the thing, and then he puts the thing and the thing, and the thing blows up. And the kids all start laughing at me, and I'm like, what? What was so, what was so funny? Like, we didn't understand a word you said. <laughs> Like we know what movie you're talking about, but what are you, what put the thing of the thing? What is that? <laughs> like, thank you, Merlin, man. Uh, that's anyway. called mossy compression. <laughs> <laughs> you nerd. <laughs> yep. Oh man, <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of artifacts on that in that analogy I was making. <laughs> a lot of macro blocks. <laughs> oh, indeed. Oh, now I'm like triple pink. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Uh, okay, so um, so wh what else we got? <laughs> what else do we have? Um, so I thought it would it'd be interesting. Speaking of of uh, Merlin Man, that's that's quite the. Uh, easy stepping stone mentioning him and then um, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about uh, maybe the topic is time management but it's also just uh, dealing with time as a factor in creative projects mm -hmm. whether it, mm -hmm. it's affecting what projects you pick or uh, how you go about them both so yeah that kind of thing I'm curious so um, when when you're dealing with that, um, what um, let's see, does it when you think about a new project, how does your um, how does time factor in for you? Um, does it depend on how fresh the idea is, or yeah, this is a toughie. It's a, it's a big question you just lobbed at me um, because like you can easily. One of the problems with with uh, being a creative person is that once you start getting at all good at it, like feel, and I don't mean good at it, like oh you're award winning. I mean like like you feel like you're getting a knack for it, and it's coming easier to you than it used to, right? Because like the first part of it is when you're starting to do it is it's just it's just hard enough just to do it. So like you. You, your eyes can't get bigger than your stomach when you're first starting out because the struggle of creating the thing itself is so difficult that you don't even want to think about any future projects. You just want to get through this one. I just try not to drown right now, right? But then once you get like you know you're getting a good doggy paddle going and you're like, hey, I'm not drowning, I'm not drowning. Suddenly you'd be like, oh, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this, and the excitement of having that sense of power becomes. A potential danger to you because you can wind up getting yourself distracted and spread too thin over too many things, too many projects, too many ideas, and the new shiny thing becomes this wonderful thing that you want to put all your attention on. And next thing you know, you are, are up against a wall with not having any time to do anything, and you've got all these unfinished projects, and then now you're in the pit of despair because, oh my god, I'm a hack after all. I thought I was good at this doggy paddling thing, and now I've got, uh, you know, 12 different goals in the pool to try to get to at once, and everybody's cheering me on. And I'm going to fail, right? I suck at this thing after all. Mm. Um, so, yeah, you know, uh, w once you start getting a knack, the next thing you got to do is figure out how to evaluate how much time everything's going to take. And, um, and, and it's something over the last five years I've really made a mess of again and again and again. And I'm only now really feeling like I'm getting a sense of being able to look at something that I want to do and have a, any kind of clear sense of, okay, well, this is going to take X amount of time. I, what's weird is, like, 10 years ago, I was good at it. I was good at evaluating what I had time for and what I didn't. But then once I started getting into the swing of making comics on a regular basis and, and doing work that I was really proud of, then all of a sudden I fell completely out of it. Um, I think initially I was, I was way scared of overextending myself because I wanted to, because I was at that stage where I was really trying to get better at it. And then once I got to the point where I did a couple projects where I look at it and go, I'm so glad I did that, and I'm going to be able to look at that for the rest of my life and go, hey, that was good. Um, that's when I started, I, I, my eyes got bigger than my stomach. 
and I started taking on too many things, and things didn't get finished uh, because of that. Am I getting anywhere with this? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's wild where, um, <clears throat> I mean, you, I think you kind of wrote a book there about time management and being a creative person just by, I mean, you, you've got the, 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 the general summary of, of starting out. It's like, well, it's hard to even put out like one blog post. And then eventually you, you're you're able to do that, and then you can do it on a regular basis. And then you're like, well, I have thoughts on more topics or comics, or you start to post regularly to a sketch blog, and all of a sudden you're like, well, I'm been, I've been practicing storytelling. You occasionally you 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 build capabilities, and all of a sudden you can draw upon them, and that's satisfying. Maybe a little bit like a drug, right? Um, I'm I'm oh, guessing. Yeah. Um, brain chemistry come in, comes into all this. Not that I'm an expert on that at all, but it's probably, uh, you know, just getting if, if fed the right... Uh, it's a great way of... If it's not scientific, it's a great way to think about it. <laughs> it's like endorphins kick in. And you're like, hey, that felt great! <laughs> you know? Yeah, that endorphins and dopamine and, and uh, your, your brain saying, hey, you've, you've, you know, put together a way to succeed in... in in this big complicated thing that I've been impatient and annoying and punishing you about and all of a sudden now you're doing it so good job and all of a sudden you do more of it okay now do more okay now do more and uh, <clears throat> so there's that aspect but then there's the whole um, it's not like it's a straight line either which I think that was interesting with um, the uh, there's like that meta skill set separate from being a creative person. The the, the whole maybe the, you know that's where maybe we are talking about time management a bit today, um, not just the creative projects and time, because I guess that's how you can sort of orchestrate and uh, be you know predictable about what you're doing. But what's funny is so how you mentioned um, uh, estimating and uh, uh, having a feel for how long projects took. What what got you to the point to be good at that? And then, like, what caused that to get set aside? Because I think you went into that a little bit, but... It, yeah, yeah. Not a lot. Okay, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn this back on you, too, because I don't want, it to, I don't want this to be just an interview with me, but... Um, <laughs> what, <Flip it. laughs> when, uh, in, in 2002, when I did a miniseries for, for Antarctic Press that I was really fired up about. It was my first miniseries. I was really excited about it. I was working on uh, the project with a great writer. I knew that this thing was going to mean good things for my career, uh, providing people see it. Um, so I poured my guts into it, and like I've told the story a million times in other places, uh, I was working full-time. I was freelancing at the time, so I was working 40 to 50 hours a week on just my money-making stuff, and then I was putting in you know, the uh, equal amount of time on this comic because I had three months to do a three-issue miniseries. So three monthly books uh, where I was penciling, inking, toning, and lettering the book, right? So it was a lot of work. Uh, I, I ran on four hours of sleep a night uh, for three months. It made myself sick, and I told that story a bunch of times. Um, but what that taught me was a page takes X amount of hours, right? Uh, my most ambitious pages tend to take, on average, X amount of time. So when I sat down to do start doing web comics, and I was trying to figure out what's going to be my update strategy, because this is back in 2003, so at this time there wasn't RSS, or at least if it, if it was there, it was really new, and not many people were using it yet. Uh, so really the way you built an audience was by creating a regular update schedule, giving people a reason to come back to your website or bookmark the, your website. And uh, so update schedules were very, very, very important. They still are, but I mean, I think they were even more important back then, right? Uh, so I was trying to figure out, what can I handle here? All right, so a lot of people are doing three days a week. Uh, I can't do three pages a week, not with my work schedule. I have between four to 16 hours that I can allot, that I can schedule every week to do this book. And, uh, okay, well, that's going to be... There's no way I can fit more than one page in that for now. Like, you know, at the outset, I'm like, well, I could try for two. I could try. Uh, but then I said, no, but I want this to be good, and if there's no pressure to meet a publication schedule, don't push yourself that hard. Take it easy and really focus on making it great. And this will be the only thing that you'll do creatively for yourself. I mean, I was still freelancing while I was working on my webcomic. Um, so it, it broke down to understanding, <laughs> you know, have you heard of the, the blogger David Say? I have that. For the show notes. Um my wife is a big fan of this guy, and he is all about breaking your time into units. 
Like, if you ever seen the movie about a boy with uh, Hugh Grant, is that his name? Hugh Grant? Yeah. Uh, sounds uh, familiar. Yep. Uh, Nick English. Hornsby. Yep. It's a great movie. But he he talks about in the in the in the movie like you know it's like uh, everything breaks down to units. Recreation two units of time. Every unit is a half hour. Uh, getting my hair cut one unit. Uh, you know, watching uh, this game show two units. Uh, David Say has a uh, project planner on his website that you can download and print out and create your own little like project planning book. Like your uh, oh, I forget what he calls it. As a matter of fact, I'm going to try to get him on Comics Are Great because he's so into structuring your time and and uh, creating manageable uh, project planning that I think he'd be really good for cartoonists in general to hear. Um, but right. but and printed out his his uh, his time management uh, booklet. And it is all in these little boxes, uh, representing each representing like 20 minutes to a half hour or something like that. And you can structure your day that way. And then, and but it's also it's meant to be um, contributed to as you go. So as a new thing comes in, like it's like this happens. Like you're working, you got these three things you have to accomplish today, and then also these little tiny things will slip into the cracks. Oh, well, I gotta also go grab milk. Yeah. Oh, I also have to Phone get this. Calls, emails come in. Right. Can email. you take a quick meeting? That kind of thing. Yep. Um, and so. His, his, his structure is really boiling down to what are the two to three really big projects you have to do today? And then let's, let's give them those units of time and then leave these open units of time for breaks, goofing off. He actually has goofing off as scheduled units of time in there. And then also little surprises that slip in. And I'm probably misrepresenting it. You know, People can go to his blog and check it out. But this guy is all about productivity. Um, maybe even more so than Merlin Mann nowadays. But um, anyway, that was my first... Oh, his, I think his name is, pronounced, is spelled S E A H. David Say. Um, okay. But um, it, it really began with me understanding what is generally speaking a unit of time that it takes to create a page. And there's always going to be exceptions to the rule. But if I if I allot eight to, to sixteen hours a week where I am going to be unavailable to everybody at that time, then I know I can meet this deadline. Now what happened was is I got. Two, two chapters into this online graphic novel, and I was getting pretty good at it. It was starting to come easier to me, like easier than it was before. Um, and I started to make friends online. And uh, these friends and I would talk about, oh, it'd be really cool to do this, it'd be really cool to do that. Oh, we should totally do it. We should, yeah, we should totally do it. And then I wound up adding to that workload. But I had the, the presence of mind to say, I can't do it like I'm doing my online graphic novel. I can't do the penciling, inking, lettering, toning, and uh, the pre-press, you know, web publishing aspect. I can't do all of that for this comic. If I'm going to do one more thing, I can allot four more hours. I'm going to find four more hours in my weekly schedule, and then we'll break it down. Where I'll put in four hours on penciling, you put in four hours on inking, and then we'll figure out a way to do the toning and lettering between the two of us kind of thing. Uh, so then I did finish up the next two years doing that, doing two comics at the same time. And then that's where it fell apart for me, is that after that I started getting really ambitious. I was feeling really high off of finishing the, this, uh, these two different online graphic novels, which are in print. You can get them at my store. It's at comicsagreat.com. Go to the Jersey's Books link. Um, is that the, uh, the front and the replacements? Front and the replacements, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, you don't have to mention my name because <laughs> anybody who's really curious will find him. Uh, I, I want to. Now they're, <laughs> now they're going in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> but but anyway, so. the the exuberance of finishing two big long term projects like that got me thinking really big pie in the sky stuff, and I felt like this pressure of like this is something that I I'm learning to grapple with is the sense of we got to do it now we got to do it now we got to do this thing before anybody else does this thing we got to do this new big project because it's so exciting it's so such a unique idea that if I don't do it somebody else is going to do it and I'm going to miss my chance to do this thing so that's when I did sugary cereals and that's where time management fell apart for me because I was in new waters I was editing and contributing to an online comics anthology that I thought had to update every day and uh, I had, so we were working three months ahead of schedule. You know, we had three issues finished before anything started updating on the website. So I had a pretty big buffer in place. But now I'm managing 10 to 12 people who are all contributing to this thing and editing their work. And when I say editing, that means like providing input 
in feedback on things, not like saying like, oh, you can't do this or you can't do that, but really working with the person to help develop their content so it fits within the parameters that I had developed for Sugary Cereals. So I'm managing the blog, I'm managing all the update schedules, all these daily update schedules of web comics. I'm working with cartoonists four months, five months ahead trying to help them develop their story for the thing. I'm also uh, collecting all the work to be printed, to be sold in the store. There was no time left for me to create anything anymore. Because I didn't, this was new waters, I didn't know what units of time these things were going to take. I was excited about the project, I just dove right in. And, you know, bless Barry Gregory and the folks at Kablam for backing me on this thing, because it was a really ambitious project, and I didn't, I was so naive that I didn't realize how much work went into it. So that was my first big learning experience. And then the second one was in doing this, this teaching and comics advocacy work that I got into shortly after Sugary Serials through, through doing the Art and Story podcast, through doing comics workshops and working with the Ann Arbor District Library. Um, again, it starts out with these little things where it's like, it'd be really fun to do this thing where I lead a workshop. Oh, well, now I'm, the workshops are getting into high demand and now I'm doing them three, four days a week. Uh, and couple that with travel time, couple that with class prep time, follow up with students. It, it becomes, you know, it quickly takes over your life. And when, when, when do I get to draw anymore? So as you know, about three or four months ago, I instituted this rule that Thursdays and Fridays, I don't take any appointments. I don't go to any meetings. I don't travel anywhere. I just stay at home and I work on my comics work. And that's been a rule that I've been sticking to for the most part. And I feel really good about it. I'm getting stuff done in the background, stuff that I can't show anybody. It's going to be in some work that comes out in print. But um, I'm getting headway again on it, which I wasn't for a long time. And so that was like sort of like an emergency lever I had to pull, you know, like nobody gets Thursdays and Fridays anymore uh, because I was losing track of how do I know what these how long these things are going to take? Well, hmm. with the comics work, I had that with these new ongoing projects. I leap in without a sense of it. And I think that with all future projects, I need to approach it with a sense of. How much time is this going to take? Oh, kids read comics too. That's also a big one. That one takes a lot of my time. So, you know, but I don't know. How do you evaluate how much time something's going to take when it's a brand new thing? You can't, can you? You can't. It's, I mean, <clears throat> you can wish it. <laughs> you can, well, there's factors. You can say no matter what, this is what I'm going to give it. And that's where, you know, you can do, you know, art challenges in that way or whatever. But it's really tough to do if you are, uh, there's something about doing art as a service, I think, where there's those extra uh, coordination, communication, marketing, um, some, uh, uh, let's see, collaboration and just nurturing of the service. Like you mentioned, um, like you could plan your your um, on-site visits for teaching based on the the um, the scheduled hour for the class or or the the hours and and what have you. But I I'd assume like you you giving more service and uh, uh, caring a lot about the the result of of teaching or whatnot. I mean you're putting in more time than that. So it's not just um, a, a lot of projects have that sort of envelope that you end up needing to stuff it in that makes it take up more space if you're if you're losing using those blocks on your you know or, or just even looking at hours in the day where there I mean some things some tasks actually will take up a spin up time too where um, you you have to load a lot in your in your mind before you can go forward and execute like s some coding tasks can be like that um, oh hmm. yeah yeah that's that's a good point to make is that uh, an hour and a half workshop, this is something I learned the hard way. I didn't realize this when I started, but an hour and a half workshop is really two to two and a half hours of time, right? And I'm not even talking about travel time. I'm talking about showing up a half hour early to make sure all the equipment is set up. Is my projector ready? Do I have the handouts? Uh, greeting any uh, early arrivers. And then there's a half hour afterwards where the students stick around and they ask all sorts of follow-up questions and extra stuff. You know, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I could be all diva about it and say, time is up. I'm out of here, right? And just walk out. That's the time you guys paid for. That's all you get. But when you're doing any kind of a service, you assume, or at least I'm learning to assume, that there's going to be a buffer of a half hour on either end at the least for any particular job. And then, like you talked about spin-up time, I think that's really important, too, is that... Um, 
I remember when I was a blackjack dealer, uh, and this would be in my early 20s, uh, saving up money, um, put my wife through school. Uh, you just went out to the table and started dealing. You know, I punch in, you just run to the table and you start counting cards, right? 15, take a hit and that kind of thing. Uh, when I got a job as a graphic designer later on as a corporate graphic designer, there was this blissful 45 minutes at the beginning of my day looking over what needs to be done and getting my brain attuned to the thinking process needed to make these things happen. When it's a simple repetitive task, yeah, you can just jump into it. And maybe I'm a little rusty this morning with the blackjack dealing, but uh, I miscounted a hand and somebody got mad at me. Uh, but uh, but for the most part, it was pretty easy to dive into counting cards. <laughs> Whereas when you're doing something that's like a little bit more sophisticated and, and uh, creative, you do need some spin-up time as well. So you do need to, to front-end that. Is that the proper terminology? Put that on the front end to assume that you're going to spend 20, that, 20 minutes to a half hour getting ready for that thing. Yep. Yeah. Um, it, the, there is a... Uh, there's just an additional time on both both sides of the task uh, a lot of times and and when you have what's knowing that and knowing exactly what you're going about doing you have a good chance of estimating accurately or reasonably accurately um, but as soon as you start introducing a lot of unknowns um, I really don't think I think it's wise to estimate so you have some kind of you know focus and 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 prepared time to to go about it. But um, hopefully you have you know the ability to uh, um, to bring in time from other areas, or you've blocked out way more time than you would expect. Because um, what I've noticed when when I haven't tackled a problem before, um, especially if it's if it's in the world of software. Um, I find that uh, the the front loading and understanding a problem can really take quite a bit of time uh, because it's really unclear what um, what needs to be done and how how it needs to be done. And um, <clears throat> I'm not only looking for, um, for instance, well, when I when I built the uh, the gallery widget. Um, that was a that was a thing on my to do list. So we have this uh, the the gallery at leanintoart.com of uh, student and teacher works, and uh, that's built off of a few um, jQuery components and some of my own code that um, I welded it all together. Um, but before I, I couldn't have told you like how long that project was going to take because I'd never done it before. Um, now if I went to do another gallery with very similar features, yeah, I have a good idea of what it would take. And in fact, well, it may be a lot faster because it's what I built is pretty reusable. So it, it depends. And uh, um, but that that uh, the hindsight, it's good to um, I, I found uh, it's it's helpful to just uh, pay attention. How long did that take? Oh, okay, make note of it. Things come up again, and they're of a similar ilk. I can say, oh, that'll t probably take me. Um, probably about 20 hours and well in my current schedule I've got um, a block of time available about four hours a night and I can you know probably spread that out over about five nights probably you know so you end up dealing with not only the time it takes but also the um, like if you're making a promise to someone which is an interesting aspect of this time thing when you're creating something did you also create an expectation or are you wanting to actually Either way, whether you did or not, is there going to be an expectation of a regular occurrence of this or a special event? Hey, next Friday I'm pu publishing a really cool article about how I built the gallery widget, which I'm not. <laughs> I already did some podcasts about it, whatever. But like, let's say you know you set those kind of expectations. Well, hopefully you have um, a good idea of what it's going to take to deliver on what you promised. And right then, then there's times when you just don't know. And uh, you were bringing up also making promises to people. Another thing that really throws a monkey wrench in the works. And I don't want to, I don't want to turn this into like a complain fest. Uh, mm. But let's say you complain. spread it across five days, like you said, right? I'm going to mm. put four hours a day for five days to do this thing. Um, and if you're doing multiple projects, then all of a sudden that inbox dings. And somebody says, hey, that thing that, that you know, we talked about last week, I need it today. Can you do it? 
Well, now you got to re back up, respin for the, the the emergency project that you got to get out the door, and then get that out the door. And now you just lost. Let's say it took 20 minutes. Now you're losing a full hour in the respin up to the new to the thing you were working on before, right? Mm. This is one that really kills me. Is uh, I also need to learn to shut off my email during certain hours of the day. Um, it's wonderful that we live in a time where we're so accessible all the time. But on the other hand, 11 o'clock at night when I'm trying to like get a uh, you know a long-term project, just get, steal a couple hours to work on it, and all of a sudden, ding! This person I work with on a, on, a, on another project says, "Hey, I got I got something that really needs to be taken care of right now." Um, if if I just make it clear that hey my my inbox is closed between these hours, you can email me all you want, but I'm not responding till the morning. That's something I need to really take a stand on because it that really can destroy my week. Uh, a couple little events like that will just wreck everything I had planned. I don't know about you. Does that happen to you? Uh yeah, absolutely. It's um there's I mean there's some some of the sometimes when I'm making a plan for building a project, I um. I'll know, like, there's a lot of risk, cause especially if it's spread out over too many days. And, um, you know, that's something that, that is of a big enough, it's, it's complex enough, or there's a, there's a lot of pages in it, or whatever the, that, that is. If it's, um, you know, uh, music, code, or um, <clears throat> comics. Uh, yeah, it, it, if I can do it in, a, in one session, that's how I think of it, is how many sessions am I, am I going to need to do this? Um, the risk is low that I will, um, the, the, there's a low risk of failure, right? Um, but as soon as it stretches out to too many sessions, yeah, there, there's just um, a lot of other, um, you know, projects and roles and, and uh, service and, and whatnot that, that I'm involved in that, that could, could come in. And uh, I like that idea about breaking things into sessions, too. I mean, that's how I manage doing web comics. Uh, Mm -hmm. for those those few years where I was updating reg regularly with a webcomic was I had certain days of the week where that was allotted, right? So Friday, you know, I think it was like Friday nights. Uh, those were nights where I worked on the comic. I would do penciling and some inks on Friday night. Saturday, I would do, uh, you know, clean up. And then I would have a couple hours on Sunday to finish it up. If, if, if something, if the worst should happen, like something happens on Sunday where, oh, my in-laws are in town and now I don't get to draw, it would get time shifted. But there were those blocks of time on the calendar every week. And it was understood between me and everybody else in my life that those, those sessions were not to be interrupted. Um, and it makes it more manageable, too. So it's not like, you know, the, if you talk about creative projects, uh, when I talk about making a comic i talk about breaking everything into realms of areas of concern so like at the penciling stage you're only worried about this so that you don't have to worry about these other things because if you attack a page you know and you're both you're writing it you're thumbnailing it, you're penciling it you're inking it and you're coloring it all in one session that's too many choices to take on that's too many you, you're going to you're going to drop the ball on some things and so you break it into areas of concern so you can really put a laser beam focus on this one aspect at the penciling level i'm just worried about getting gesture and, and fluidity and drawing things right at the inking level, I'm just worried about how line value is going to contribute to this overall puzzle. At the coloring level, I'm worried about something else. Um, so by breaking things into sessions, too, you're making the whole project not quite so daunting, right? Like if we, 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 if we sat down to do Lean Into Art as a project uh, back in January and said, let's build it. we got two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We could, could have been, yeah, we tried that. Yeah, instead of mm -hmm. spending months really tweaking it and playing with it and focusing on certain things at some times and certain things at other times anyway. Um, yeah, it, what's funny, so what's cool is uh, you pointed out the, the, the idea of the sessions, it works both ways where um, it's really nice. I Actually, I love the satisfaction of, of um, projects that, that I can finish in one setting. Um, it's, very, it's wonderful to just get something complete. But then again, some things are, are far better served with adding a little bit of time in there and uh, giving it some room to breathe. And uh, it, it helps with, with you know, focus and what are you worried about. Like you mentioned areas of concern. Um, <clears throat> that's a good, uh, that, that's an idea I use all the time. And, and you, you, simplifying uh, bigger problems into smaller ones. And... Uh, hashing them out, which I think that's what this is. This really is. is I think we've talked about something that's 
a little bit of you have the, the external aspect of like when you promise something and also um, how when you promise something across you know different parties where you have this project you're working on but then you have you and then you have other roles well like the in-laws or whatnot come out come over and uh, there's sort of it's like but all of it together is like this expectation management and uh, whatever and so what's interesting is I think we're kind of summarizing in a, in a, in a, a general approach what I'm really curious is um, and that kind of highlights some of the things in there um, <clears throat> there's a lot of the um, what's a what's a taste of the nitty-gritty of making that work right so when uh, when you go about What's funny, I know I'm turning it into, into an interview of you. I'll, I won't do this. For, I'll, I'll ask myself this question so I don't... Yeah, yeah. just, just make nope, sure that you come back at it with your own take on it, too. I mean, that's all. Okay. Well, okay, so I, I, I'll ask you this question. So when you... Um, uh, you mentioned the concept of, of the time blocks. Do you... Uh, what, what kind of... How do you deal with this? Do you deal with... Uh, do you manage things with, with sort of tasks and projects, or do you deal with uh, just blocks of time that you put stuff that happened to be tasks and projects in there. Um, and like what tool do you use to do that? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, okay. We can, get to, we can get to some tool things. Um, I am very bad at breaking things into specific tasks. I can break things into, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm going to allot two hours. Man, that sounds funny for me to say because I just talked about breaking things into areas of concern. When it comes to my comics work, I'm great at breaking it into those tasks. Today is penciling. I'm just going to pencil. Today is inking. I'm just going to ink. Uh, but when it comes to any other kind of creative project, like if it's to build something for a website or if it's to develop some teaching content, um, it's really hard for me to internally break that into a list of, oh, I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this. Uh, I, I am the kind of person who figures it out as I go along a lot of the time. Uh, and maybe this is similar to the fact that when I write, I do most of the writing. When I write, when I write my stories, I do most of the writing in my head. I don't sit down and write down copious notes in text uh, or anything like that. I'll sketch out ideas and stuff, but knitting the ideas together happens mostly in my head, and then when it's congealed enough to where I feel like I got a handle on it, then I'll write it down just so I don't lose that afterwards. But for the most part, that happens internally. And it's the same thing with my project management. I'll say, this block of time, work on some teaching stuff. I know that I have to achieve X by 5 o'clock. So from 1 to 4... I'm going to allot that time to, to make sure that that thing happens. This could be a problem, uh, and it has been a problem in the past, where because I haven't broken it down to, and this is one of the reasons that Anne has been leaning on me to use the David Say method of prioritizing things into those units of time, the very specific blocks, um, is that sometimes I'll assume that, okay, that, that's a 1 to 4 thing. Uh-oh, it took till 4.30. It took till 4.45. Now that cut into the next unit of time. That happens so to me I, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and part of it is, I think, I do think that part of it is the thrill of a game. That's what makes this so interesting and fun to do sometimes, is like be trying to beat the clock. And when you beat it, you feel great. You walk, I, I go to pick up Ann from work and I'm doing the Rocky, you know, run, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, the sweaty, the sweaty sweatshirt and everything, the towel around my neck, and I feel like a million dollars. But when it when I don't beat the clock, oh my gosh, that that is such a low. It is such a low, and it'll wreck the rest of my day. Um, I will really it it'll sometimes it'll plunge me right down into the whole self torture of I'm a hack, I'm no good, I'm a faker. Who who am I to even try to do this stuff? You know, so it, it's it's a dangerous game to play too, right? So just like gambling. Oh yeah. <laughs> Just like gambling, <laughs> it's just like gambling, just with your your day to day life. Just yeah, just with your life. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's all. Oh, that's that's, that's yeah, small stakes. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you know, so like I, I just break it into units of time. I look at my week and I say, and and I, I use a variety of tools for this. Um, my immediate capture for this is Google Calendar. So like the moment somebody mentions anything that needs to be accomplished. Uh, I'll just jot a note in my uh, my calendar app on my phone, and you know I, I want to go on a sub note just for a second before we get deeper into tools. Um, what's your take on people pulling out their phone to take a note on something? Do you find that um, it's still offensive? It's still a faux pas, or is it becoming more generally accepted as a, as a a way to capture ideas? I think you're asking the wrong guy. Yeah. Um, because I've been someone who says, "All right, cool. I'm taking a picture of this whiteboard or whatever." 
um, since I had a digital camera in my pocket, which is way before they were on phones and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so yeah, any means to capture a note I think is awesome. I think it's extending your memory, and uh, I, I, I think it means someone is listening to me all the more. And I, I've, my heart is warmed when I see someone take out a device. I don't care if it's a camera or, uh, you know, if it's an iPod or a, or whatever the heck they're doing to put their micro notes in. What's micro that? cassette recorder. <laughs> yeah, exactly, micro cassette recorder. Note to self, whatever, transcribe. Awesome. Um, warms my heart. See, I still get funny looks from some people sometimes. Like, I'll be at a meeting with a mixed group of people, and these aren't always creative people, right? This is part of being a creative person is you have to have meetings sometimes with people who aren't creative clients and and so on, um, totally. partners in projects. Some people have to need your service, right? And yeah. So. And so we'll say, okay, well, here's the timeline of when we need to have this thing done. All these people open up, like, pl uh, paper planners, which I've tried mm -hmm. using them. I tried using them. I just don't access them enough. I, it's not in the front of my mind to pull out a book when I need to go, what needs to be done today? I'm so used to being at my computer terminal and pulling it up on web pages that it just, it's the natural thing to put it digitally, to drop it in digitally. That's, that's the way I, it's going to stick for me. Mm -hmm. So I pull up my phone and I'm jotting it down on my calendar app and there's always a couple people like, oh, you know, there he is playing on his phone. He's texting somebody. No, I'm capturing this, right? Um, but yeah, I'm the same way. I also take pictures of whiteboards whenever I'm having like a group discussion, uh, in one of the uh, early, just to ahead. answer your question more directly, whatever. So, uh, I evidently, my brain is pumping me so full of chemicals when I'm doing that. And I also like other people doing that so much. I am so high that I don't care <laughs> if there is if I'm getting weird looks or whatnot. I'm like, my, I'm this, you, I'm, ca I'm storing something in my external brain. My yeah. my brain is growing. Like yeah. this is this is bliss. Um, <laughs> oh, I wish I could. I wish I could get more in touch with that because I am so self conscious about pulling my phone in my pocket. I am. I, I'm even self conscious about wearing like my my iPod earbuds. Like, oh, people know that I'm listening to an iPod. You know. Uh, I don't know. I guess I've had enough experiences with people who are like really anti-technology that uh, it makes me feel really concerned about it. And I, and I shouldn't be. Nobody should feel that way. Um, no, I anyway. see, I'm, I'm not cool in, in that way and uh, I don't really care. I know that like I'm feeding my brain in the sky and uh, you know what? You should feed your brain in the sky too. So oh man! I, That's another t-shirt! <laughs> <laughs> that is such a t-shirt. I'm feeding oh, yeah. my brain in the sky. I'm not texting. That's what I'm feeding. Because I, yeah. And, uh, and so it ends up there. I, I actually use uh, notepads quite a bit. And I play around. I, actually, I'm going to record a Polytechnicast one of these days. Because uh, this year, I've, I've tried like a fleet of different notepads. Because um, this is, because I, I, I opt for rapid capture. Whatever is the, the quickest and truest way to capture an idea. And uh, some. Sometimes that's that's digital for me, as far as where it lives first. But a lot of times, I, I love the the tactile feel. As as big of a, a techno geek as I am, I still love notepads. I, so. I capture stuff on notepads uh, as far as like big ideas. So I'll have a notepad with me and like you know, hmm. pull one up right here. Um, yeah, here's like uh, when we were uh, at a previous meeting, we had. Oh man, let's see if I can get it to. So you mentioned, oh, I should get total video converter, big idea, black marker, uh, green pen for smaller ideas. These are some tasks I have to do this week. But then they get added digitally afterwards. But it's really like a highlight reel of the meeting. What are you looking at? Super cool. No, you just reminded me of um, uh, dueling. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm always drawing all over the, you know. <laughs> Why did I draw a star? <laughs> what is that all about? That's just a star? That, that's yeah. like... Yeah, you just powered up that whole notepad where it's like, yeah. it's, it's growing a 3D star, you know, like yeah. the classic Wonder Woman logo. Um, it reminded me of um, there's a there's a TED talk that I thought was interesting. I would love it if, if it went into more depth because it's more of a celebratory TED talk. But it um, where uh, Suni Brown uh, talks about Doodlers Unite, where she's just really endorsing the idea of doodling and how it actually helps retain information and uh, 
um, enhance listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, um, as a matter of fact, I can look at some comics pages that I did, and I can look at a specific panel, and I can remember exactly what podcast I was listening to when I drew that panel. So, yeah. That is so funny. Yep, me too. When I go back, and uh, um, especially art that that I spent a lot of time on, um, sort of the, like the, episode 100 to like 120 on Art Geek Zoo especially. Like, yeah, I know exactly what music I was listening to and, um, yeah, podcasts, audiobooks. I'll just hear them all of a sudden. Yep. Um, yeah. It's wild. But um, anyway, uh, so, yeah, we got sidetracked anyway. there. Get back to tools. So, um, yeah, yeah I, I keep a pad to grab like the big headlines rapidly because, yeah, it is, it is, I'm not as speedy at, thumb typing, you know, notes into Evernote or into my Google Calendar. But if there's a, a project deadline, if there's a, th- a, a timeline that I have to have something completed, the first thing I do before I make a, a single move or even get out of my chair is add that to my Google Calendar as an event, right? This date, this thing happens. Um, that's the only way I'll remember it. The only way I, I live and die by Google Calendar to send me notifications saying, ding, you got a thing due on this date. Be aware of it. And I set two reminders I set a, a reminder a week ahead of time and a day ahead of time. So if I schedule the class, like I just scheduled the class for January 28th, 2012, uh, and same same reminders are set. So, you know, I set that now. It's October. I am not going to remember that I had that class on that date, right? Uh, and I, and I, I can't count on myself to look at my calendar every day. Uh, there, there's going to be days where I forget to. So now I've got this thing that's going to send me an email. It's going to send me a push notification on my phone saying, boom, you got a thing next week. Don't, don't forget about it. And that gives me that extra amount of time to do whatever last minute prep I need to do for the project. Um, cool. So you don't have to worry about it. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, a, that's a very, yeah, that's a very GTD kind of thing. Is it? <laughs> oh, yeah. cool. I haven't read GTD, but, uh, Anne has, and she, she really, uh, what, what's that guy's name again? Um, sh- do, 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 do. Can't I don't believe remember. Pretty... But getting things done, it's it's a yeah, well-known book series. David Allen. David Allen, that's right, yeah. She's, yeah. she's a big David Allen fan. But um, Anyway, and then the next thing I do is I transcribe everything I can into Evernote, whether that means I take a picture of my notebook. So like at some of the KRC meetings when we were developing Kids Read Comics 2011, which was where we tried out a lot of new things, and we were really spitballing how two artist alleys were going to work, right? How is it going to work in different parts of town? How are we going to get the local businesses involved? So we had a lot of different pieces of paper with a lot of different graphs of how programming was going to work. and Not, not graphs, what do you call that? Like, uh, what is it called? It's not Chart. wireframing, oh. is it? Where you put, like, boxes, you know what I'm talking about, and then you connect them with lines to show, like, how a workflow is going to go. Flowchart, flow is that it? Yep. Okay. Yep. So you're, you're showing the yeah. progressing pro- progression of events over time and the relations to one another and and when uh, sometimes you might add logic to it. So if this, then that kind of thing. If yes or no. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Yes. You're always so much more clear about things than I am. Uh, but we had a lot of flowcharts made. So rather than photocopy them, put them in a folder that I'm going to forget about. You know, I took pictures of them and dropped that into my Evernote. And now Evernote has this ability to actually read your notes. Like if you take a picture of a note, it can actually transcribe it into text and make it searchable that way if the, if the writing is clear enough. And actually, I've found that it doesn't have to be terribly clear. Um, you can get away with some very natural-looking handwriting actually being parsed by Evernote. So, and then the great thing is that I can tag them, you know, a good tagging taxonomy. Like this is a Kids Read Comics thing. Pre-planning. Uh, kids Read Comics... Uh, promotional items, right? Makes it searchable uh, for follow-up later on. You grabbing something to show? Uh, yeah, you mentioned Evernote and whatnot, so... Oh, yeah, we can pull it up so people can see what the Evernote website yeah. looks like if you're watching the video. Yeah. So there we go. Capture anything, access anywhere, find things fast. This is not an ad for Evernote. They're not paying us for this. We're just, we just use their no. service. They have a free version of their service, too, so... Uh, I mean, it limits some of what you can store and whatnot. I I, I go for their paid service, but um, <clears throat> and, I have and I thousands. think they just recently. <laughs> Do you really? Really? Well, yeah, I'm the dude. Um, yeah, I I used to you know bookmark web pages quite a bit because I treated that as like my little uh, my web my my mini web cache, 
of things I thought were cool. And so I could start typing anything in Firefox because I used Firefox back in that day when I had this habit. And um, and uh, eventually I broke Firefox because I had uh, 17,000 bookmarks. Wow. <laughs> wow. I was bookmarking about 100 some things a day depending and it was all stuff that I thought was worthwhile. And uh, but it was a it, it was an amazing tool when it worked because I could yeah. start typing anything and anything that I thought was amazing well, already bam it was in my history and boop, it would fill in the URL and um, yeah. it was like my brain in the sky junior <laughs> <laughs> no I like I like that idea about also like you know you know, I, I do an assignment with my students where it's it's about uh, finding out what their visual vocabulary is, and I send them out with cameras. Go for a walk with a camera, and anytime you see something that you say you need, take a picture of it, grab it, and then we can look at it afterwards and, find, and like you know sift through it to find out what you're interested in as a visual storyteller. But I also like this idea of having that kind of mindset. Number five, by the way. Fabulous that- Secrets. Uh, Fabulous Secrets number five, right? Oh, also. was it? Okay. I think so. Yeah. Worth no. mentioning. It's a... <laughs> Get into a lot of detail on that cool exercise. Uh, check out uh, Jersey's podcast, Fabulous Secrets, number five. Well, there we go. This episode brought to you by... Uh, Stuff Jersey. <laughs> no, but, but you know, it's, this is something that, going back a couple of years, another thing that I think is a really good skill set to develop is, um, talk about Merlin Mann again, he talks about the hipster PDA, which is a bunch of index cards, 3 by 5 index cards, just held together with a binder clip. And the, he had a system for how it worked. Like, he had, like, different categories in it. But for a while, I carried one around with me, and any time, and this is when I was really starting to get into doing the Art and Story podcast, and I realized that if I'm going to do this show every week, I have to keep an eye out for whatever is topic-worthy. And so as a, out of necessity, I developed this, this um, focus on any time an interesting thought occurs to me, jot it down as that hipster PDA. Write it down on that index card. And so I had an ongoing list of anything that occurred to me that I thought was interesting. I saw this the other day, and that interested me because it looked such and such. Right? Any kind of random, it didn't have to be anything that was fully formed as a topic idea, but just a random thought. And that, in the process of doing that, I developed the skill of noticing things more. I was much more mindful in every environment I was in, and, I, and I, eventually I didn't need it anymore. Uh, I knew I could tell in an instant whether or not that one was topic worthy or worth grabbing. And now I could just jot it into my Evernote. I have my phone on me all the time. And so I have a couple different notes in there. I have a Thunder Punch Daily topic list. Anytime an idea occurs to me, that'd be good for Thunder Punch Daily. And I quickly type it in. Uh, or, oh, that's a Fabulous Secrets one. I definitely want that for Fabulous Secrets. Or there's a third one that's like anything I do, any podcast I'm on, I want to grab this. This will be an, an idea for a follow up on something. Um, so anyway, I like this idea of bookmarking anything you think is neat and grabbing it because it's, it's like you said, you, know, you don't have to worry about it anymore. You said the thing neat, you don't have to worry about remembering it. It's like keeping a dream journal, right? You have the dream journal next to the bed. The moment that you have the cool dream, rather than trying to, like, <laughs> while you're brushing your teeth going, okay, I have to remember that part when my head turned into a banana. And then by the time you get to work, it's like, oh, it was something to do with fruit. You know, I had this dream about fruit and it was really disturbing. Uh, mm-hmm. Right, you write it down immediately. You capture it so that way, you know, even if the feelings aren't there anymore, at least information is there. Um, that's one. That's one I really got to got to get around to doing. Uh, the the dream know. journal. It's I, I I've always respected that, and I've never got around to doing that one. Um, yeah. Just a that's that's an extra little something. Yeah, a lot of interesting stuff goes on in our heads when we're sleeping, right? Uh, yeah. It'd be worth grabbing some of that stuff, uh, if not for self-reflection, at least for just like r- a random bucket of creativity that you can dip into later, right? Like here's an example of how that can be useful. Uh, when I was a kid, and I, whenever I was sick, you know, like like a like a flu kind of thing, like with the bad fever and the nausea, I would I would literally have the same dream every time. I had the same recurring nightmare every time I would get sick like that. And because of this, I remembered it very clearly. Well, there's a dream sequence in the front where Thirsty is captured by the bad guys, and he recounts this, this fever dream he always used to have. That's totally the dream I used to have. I, I modified some details because I wanted to take my personal experiences out of it. But mm-hmm. the part where he's sitting in, a, in, a, in a, a room that's thick with humid air and he's sifting through wool, that was the dream I would always have. I was in this hot room sifting through wool while uh, people that I knew were in there with me, and they seemed to be having a good time of it, and I was miserable, and I was trying to convince them that this was a terrible thing that we were undergoing. 
uh, the, the the black field with the little single red light and the emergency broadcast system beep uh, 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 tone playing. That was totally the beginning of that dream every time. So, so these things can be fuel for storytelling devices that come across like because like writing a dream sequence is super hard because you want it to feel dreamlike. But you don't want it to have too much of an internal logic. If it has too much of an internal logic, it's going to feel fabricated and artificial, right? So. Oh, sure. Yeah, it, it needs to be a funhouse mirror on reality. So there's a basis. But, but at the same time, it's so distorted and hyper, hyper real. That, that's, a, that's a cool idea. Um, yeah, I've, I have been a habitual note taker since my teens. And I still, like even, yeah, so literally working at Burger King, I would, I would take some extra tape from the register and scribble on it, uh, anything that was available. So that was the thing when I was younger is I was undisciplined. I would have pockets full of crazy different kinds of paper I encountered throughout the day and just thoughts and ideas. Anyway, but uh, yeah, so I've, but I've never picked up the Dream Journal one so still. So. Yeah. Good one. I should do that. No, no. Um, <laughs> I, I just added to your workload stuff too, like a, uh, it, uh, like it's a, it's a magical. Okay, so time, time management, um, filtering your filtering projects, coming up with a process, and all that. That's a, it's a really big topic. I mean, it, and I think we're we're really just going through a fun sampling of of um, both general ideas, but also I did I did think it'd be helpful to have some of these tools as like a takeaway. Because it, it's, um, I mean, it's all too easy to get distracted by neat yeah. stuff. But at the same time, some of this stuff is like neat and helpful. And, oh, yeah. uh, and yeah. uh, knowing how we've both chewed on this for a while, maybe there's some of those that are, that are sort of like the, the, the stronger ones that, that have mm -hmm. held up to a lot of use. Well, and another it, another reason I love Evernote is that it's um, you can integrate it with other things. Uh, for instance, in my Google Plus, uh, if I want to post something to Google Plus and I want to share it with other people, but I also want to capture it for myself, I can include in the people I share it with my Evernote email address, and then it will get shared to my Evernote as well as Google Plus. Evernote also integrates with Nosby, which is a, a to-do app that I use on my phone, and that is my work to-do app. Like, so if I'm in a meeting and I need to jot down a quick note, oh, actually, I, I can pull up Nosby. Uh, let's grab it real quick. <clears throat> I believe it's in here. Yes. So, so that, that's no. the whole uh, email integration you're talking about, where um, you have a private email address that, that feeds your account. Feed, that feeds your Evernote, and, and there's one for Nosby as well. Um, but Nasby can integrate with, with Evernote as well to where if I tag things, like so for instance, like uh, if I take a picture, like I'm at the Kids Read Comics meeting and they got that uh, flow chart and I take a picture of that and I tag it Kids Read Comics, uh, it'll also show up in my Nasby associated with my Kids Read Comics to-do list. So there's there's some, some integration with file sharing between those two. Nasby also integrates with Dropbox as well. So if you use Dropbox a lot, it's it's really powerful for that. It does. Really? So how how does it integrate with Dropbox? Now I'm now I'm extra intrigued. So okay, so I have a um, I think for with the free account you can have I think five categories of to do lists, five different to do lists that you use, and I have one that's just called work, and that one kind of umbrellas over my freelance work, my teaching work, and then any of my projects like lean into art, comics are great, etc. So I integrated it with my Dropbox. So anytime you update any Lean Into Art files on the Dropbox that we share, if I open mm -hmm. up Nosby, it gives me a notification. So I don't even have to look in my Dropbox. It's like by going to my to-do list for today of what needs to be done, it has any Evernote notes that I've taken and tagged Lean Into Art. It has my, my high uh, priority to-do items. And then also at the bottom it says, oh, and here's the latest files updated in your Lean Into Art Dropbox shared folder. Mm. So it gives you yep. kind of like a dashboard into what needs to be done today and what resources uh, are currently being updated in, in terms of did I, did I just sign did I just get you to sign up for Nasby? You heard that grunt? That's that's the uh, so there's a cost for, for adopting tools, right? Yeah. And there's a cost for uh, uh, getting rid of them because yeah. you probably um, like. Um, I actually, um, I used to use uh, Remember the Milk, and I'm not saying this to insult Remember the Milk. I think it's a good, it's a good product. Um, but there were some things about the alternate ways of accessing it, like they didn't have a great iOS client and, and whatnot mm. at the time. 
and uh, I just, it, you know, it's, some tools you end up replacing, right? I mean, so I, like I'll I'll keep something around until it, you know, it just doesn't feel good enough because I with this kind of thing, I like I really want these to be. This is like my trusty toolkit, right? This is the, yeah. you know. Uh, I, I would assume, like I haven't read Batman in ages, but I would assume Batman doesn't put something on his utility belt unless he's rather comfortable with it and proud of it and can trust it, right? And and so, yes, and if something would be a little wonky, I bet he would be happy to free up that spot from his utility yeah. belt. Absolutely, yeah. Good analogy. Um, um, I don't know. I, see, the, the screen cap I took of the Nosby page obviously was detecting that I was on a Mac so it's saying, oh, it's available in the App Store for the iPhone. I don't know if there's an Android app for it. I would assume there is. Um, yeah, but I am not sure. The iOS app is great. I love it. Um, it and, it, you know, I have in my Chrome browser tabs that uh, that launches every time I launch Chrome, uh, it pops up my Gmail and my Nosby. And those are like the two number one tabs that open up every day. Um, Nasby also has uh, email alerts that can be assigned to things. You can set due dates on to-do tasks. You can set, you can even set units of time. How much time is this going to take? Assign this four hours, and it's due on this date. Mm. So you can you can set all those parameters with your to-do oh, items. Like those project management features of to-do list apps. Have you really got into that aspect of it? Or, only, or is it just sort of categorization of tasks and giving them some context and stuff? 90% of the time it's categorization of, of tasks. Uh, but occasionally, if there is a high priority on a project, if I'm in a meeting and this needs to be done by this date and you need to make sure that you, know, you assign X amount, of, if, that, if that becomes like really on the, that comes to the surface as being an important aspect of it, I have done that in the past. I set due dates on things in my Nosby to-do items, and then I get a little email notification. This is from your work folder. This is due on this date, just a reminder. Sure. But like the hours it takes, I mean, Very, I, I, it, I'm, I like that though that feature exists, but I haven't really got into it because it's not like you're using a spreadsheet to quickly try to figure out, well, what kind of load am I under right now yeah. with these certain tasks or try out scenarios? I haven't found a tool that really does that well. No, no. I, yeah, so I don't, because of that, I don't use it that often. Uh, but, you know, the, 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 the number one the of any... Are awesome, as it is. I mean, I, yeah. I, I still love these kind of to-do tools. And, um, but. The due date thing is the one I use the most. Uh, over anything else. And then again, like the integration with, um, especially with group projects, like anything I'm, I'm coordinating with a lot of people, I, I, I shift between Evernote and Nosby. Uh, I use that integration between the two to really, you know, keep an eye on what's the big picture and what's trying to be done here. Um, so yeah, I, but then in addition to that, I also use Wonderlist, which is a separate to-do app, completely separate thing. And I don't know if that one is available for Android. I mean, obviously, I, I got it for my iPhone. Uh, Actually, I'm pretty sure it is because they built it with one of the cross-platform uh, web browser app okay. platforms. Um, oh, and it, it's totally escaping me right now. Oh, it's it, free for every device, yeah. Yeah, it's not PhoneGap. It's um, Wonderlist was built with... Um, uh, I don't know. We'll put it in the show notes. It's okay. escaping, but it's essentially a, a project a bit like uh, PhoneGap, but it's a competing project that um, <clears throat> you can build an HTML5 web app and wrap it up and you know distribute it to whatever mobile platform, BlackBerry, iOS, Android. Okay. Yep. Um. Anyway, the the way I use Wonderlist is much more of a playful way. Uh, this is like staying on top of my mostly my personal life. Like so, like this is like where I put my grocery lists and things. But also with my friends and my creative colleagues, anything like the, those who I know sh who who use this app, you can share a to do list with them just by sending an email, right? So like, you send an email to them, and then they'll they'll get it in their Wonderlist, and then uh, you can actually you know keep track of a. Uh, a group list, um, and 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 what I also like about it is they have a very kind of uh, I don't want to say a playful interface, but it, it's much more of an iOS ish interface. It's less, it's not as corporate. It has a, like kind of like a artsy designed feel to it, mm -hmm. and even their notifications are 
playful. Like, so if you set a notification, like this is due at this time, uh, and if, you know the, the the deadline comes and goes, you get a little email that says, "Ahoy, matey, you had a thing due. You know, you're supposed to do it." So it's just it's it has like a kind of a like a friendly uh, interface with it. And that, that, that's how I should say. Instead of it's not playful, it's friendly. Um, it, yeah, it has a it has a um, an attractive aesthetic to it. Um, it's uh, you can tell they're pl they're playing that up as a feature. So you know, yeah. and, and again, you, if you if you like your tools in that way, you think, oh yeah, this is this is a beautiful. Then that can be a good feature. Yeah. I think of Nasby as like using um, Outlook to do my email, right? That's a certain experience in using Outlook to do your email. It feels oh. businessy. I'm not going to write LOL in an email that I send through Outlook, but in using like my mail app on my Mac or you know just using the Gmail web interface, that that can uh, have a more casual feel to it. Does that make any sense? Did I say anything that that parses it out to English? It makes a lot of sense. It makes too much sense. Now, now I'm now I'm. Uh, I'm not as close to adopting Nasby as I was a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to bring up the dreaded Outlook. I just meant like in terms of, you know, the Outlook interface is sort of it's like, serious. it's, it's uh, for, forbidding, right? <laughs> yep. And, and Nasby's interface is not forbidding. It's just that it's, it feels much more like, okay, this is, you're using this to get some stuff done. You're not here to like, ooh and ah, how pretty anything is, right? Yeah, very good. Yeah, it's very functional as opposed to this is this is purposefully um, aesthetically. Yeah. Um, they made that a feature. I, I don't know what to. Yeah, design mm -hmm. is is a is a key thing for Wonderlist. What's your tool um, tip? So let's see. I actually use uh, Toodle Do, and. Um, I actually I, I just like their their the terms of their uh their license and uh the uh um overall organizing features and whatnot. Uh and I liked their um their iOS app and they actually it integrates with a different app that I use called uh, Pocket Informant. Um I use Pocket Informant as sort of like my my interface to my Google Google Calendar and my um to-do list. So it's it it behaves a little bit like a, um, I didn't actually bring you know capture their website, but uh, Pocket Informant looks kind of like a uh, a classic uh, physical binder. So like uh, the old Franklin planners and whatnot. I'm sure they're still around, but um, I used to use Franklin planners in my early 20s, right? And uh, and yeah, I liked them. So what and it, what's interesting is, is uh, Pocket Informant sort of remerges all that stuff together again, your to-do list, whatever, and it just um, and but the data is up in the cloud, right? I mean, so you know, the calendar is at Google, and the um, to-do list is at Toodle Do, mm. and I uh, like how how that feels, um, even though um, Toodle Do's UI is is a bit you know a bit functional focused. Um, Pocket Informant is not cheap. It is uh, $13 in the App Store. I'm looking it up right now. It's because yeah, they're going after that Franklin Planner market. <laughs> I'm looking at it now. I don't I know. think I've ever I, used this. I, I can... I've used... Uh, so I, I've used um, a pocket PC since uh, the days of the... What, what was it? The uh, who Was it the Casio? Was it the Cassiopeia? I think. Um, it was a uh, one of the the, the black and white uh, um, LCD screen um, plastic stylus, very very palm yeah. competing. Except it, it had more of a Windows aesthetic to uh, to the apps and whatnot. And uh, since those days, I've been using a flavor of Pocket Informant off and on. And uh, I don't know, I like it. I like Ooh, the location based alerts for tasks. Now this is coming out with iOS five, but man, that is a biggie. That's a that's a really nice thing. Um which yeah, that's a big G T D thing too, is the contexts and mm -hmm. I've played around with that, but I've not I'm not a master of contexts. I just have I was just gonna ask, because yeah, that's something where I've had a lot of trouble really wrapping my brain around using contexts. So, Guy, can you explain the general concept of it, or is it is that well, even too? Contexts are um, uh, why worry about things on your to-do list when you're in no situation to deal with them. 
so uh, if you're at your uh, home office versus uh, client site versus uh, the grocery store or the library, uh, your to-do list could just self-filter and say, you know what, remember these three books that you wanted? Why, why would you be, want to be alerted about that or have that clutter up the list when you're at uh, the client site, right? Um, so it's just a little, it's like tagging it or tagging a task, but then give it, it which, um, you know, it just happens to be location, more or less. More or less, I mean, because context doesn't just have to be. It could be I am, um, you know, I'm, the, let's see, I, I, I'm involved in family time, right? So family time, I wanted to remember, we're going to read this, this new cool book or, we're, you know, something, right? Uh, so it could be that too, of course. It's not just location. Um, yeah. Now, Toodle, Toodle Do looks similar to Nosby. I mean, it's a different, the interface is slightly different, but it looks like it does a lot of the same stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, it's that Dropbox um, awareness, which um, has me tempted to try Nosby. Yeah. Well, that that's what made me stick with Nosby was the fact that it had Evernote and Dropbox integration. I mean, mm -hmm. when you're dealing with like a project where you're dealing with more than two or three people, that becomes super super useful. Um, yeah. And and then back on the Evernote thing, uh, the I think the latest version they allow you to actually edit shared lists now with the free account. See, I'm still working with my free account, and I'm looking at, I'm looking uh, a paid account in the eye because I'm filling it up. <laughs> but uh, but. Uh, one of the things that I was playing with was the idea of um, creating a shared Evernote between me and my fellow Kids Read Comics organizers, but I created the, the note, and uh, uh, we were having a devil of a time all editing it. So I think that they just changed that, too. That would be something to look into for later. Uh, sure. That could be limited in the demo. Kind of mm -hmm. makes sense. And um, that's why, that's why I, I, I constantly oscillate back and forth between using systems like 37 Signals, Basecamp, Right, because that's that does a lot of the same thing with like kind of shared project planning, but uh, I, I I get really into it for a while and then I back off and I don't use it. I mean, we've been using it with Lean Into Art and we kind of filter, we kind of you know oscillate back and forth between actually applying it to, to anything. Well, with all the tools, um, there there's these these mild frictions that uh, you know if it doesn't quite fit into your approach or how you think about about the task or, or managing the task then yeah. um, you're sort of going through this extra step and this extra packaging that um, even if it's subtle that that at, it, it, it's less appealing the next time you know I would argue that it's it's when your brain saying nope that's fine you're managing that but you're not getting your drugs nope <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, this this was kind of a pain. Why'd you make us do this? Yeah. <laughs> but not the rip on Basecamp. It just it's pretty darn good. But it has this. In some ways, Basecamp is a little bit too stripped down. Where, you know, I again I don't. I, um, I have this habit when I go about managing a lot of data, a lot of tasks and whatnot. I like to go. I like to oscillate back and forth between um, specific mode and general mode. Where general mode, I'm looking at a list and I'm managing managing a list. Specific mode, I like to go into each item, and tweak and refine and manage it. And I think, yeah. uh, uh, in my experience, uh, Basecamp is really good at specific mode, but not general mode. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting way to put it. I'll have to look at it again and see if that jives with what, what with what's making me not use it all the time. Um. I think and also, it, it's partially, it's like, I want something, what really changed things for me was when the iOS calendar app allowed to sync, or was able to sync with GCal without mm -hmm. having to sync it to my desktop calendar. So that's why you used to have to do it. Like, use it in your desktop calendar app, you subscribe to your Gmail calendar, and then I'd have to sync that every time on my phone. Well, now I can just do it right from the phone. I can just open the calendar app add to my Gmail calendar right from the calendar app on the go. That changed a lot of things for me. And uh, access to one universal calendar that can be sifted by something else is a big thing, whereas Basecamp, you're really dealing with their calendar that you can subscribe to in your Gcal. But that's another calendar application I have to open up and mess with, right? You know, that's a good point. The, de the, the lack of deep integration there with your yeah. main calendar, that, that has a cost. 
you know, here's here's a like a sort of a thousand foot observation is, and I I know I've said this before, but it, oh, it needs to be underlined. When I was a kid, I thought that what was really going to be awesome was getting a hundred emails a day and having to look at my calendar before I did anything, right? Like like having to say, let me look at my schedule. You know, I was like, oh, I'm going to feel like a man when I have to do that. It is not fun. <laughs> I don't like it at all. I missed the days when I was like. Yeah, let's get together Saturday and not having to, you know, look at anything. You know, not it's like it's like the the finding out that I have to do quarterly taxes, right? It's like it, on one hand, it's a threshold. It means that I'm a businessman, I'm running my own business, and I'm a grown up, and I'm doing cool things. But on the other hand, I got to do my quarterly taxes. You know, so it's like yeah, it's like all this like fascination with these productivity tools is fun because it's solving like a really big problem. And uh, it could sound like a lot of like posturing, like, look how busy we are. We got to look at our calendars all the time. But it's not like that at all. It's like, oh, I got to do this so that I don't like, spontaneously combust in my work day. Yeah, and it, it's the, well, we've taken on enough things where it's a necessity to be reliable and give a good service. Well, well um, I don't know. I, I would think it's a common problem. I, I, I know that I so. you're likely to... to um, you know, if you're really into being creative and you love taking on extra projects and all that kind of stuff, I mean, you're you're going to be just drowning in this kind of challenge. Um, but I think everyone runs into this. If if you if you even have like one creative projects project and it's not the the same as your source of income, um, yeah. doesn't it doesn't take much before you're you're stuck doing some of this stuff. Um, so I don't know that the the tool stuff. Yeah, I I don't know if there's any other things that were worth uh, going into there. Um, I guess um, just to sh uh, do a quick overview of a few other things I use. I I, I do use the heck out of Evernote, um, but lately for my my main tasks, I've been I've been experimenting with something that was mentioned. Um, I can't believe we haven't really given a a big uh, Tada! Again, t to uh, the Back to Work podcast because really, if you're curious about this as a topic, that's a good place to go to um, to be exposed to this kind of info in in the context of they really try to chew on the idea of giving us uh, let's see, working effectively as a knowledge worker typically and or someone being a small business person and or just wanting to get better at what you do. How do you manage that stuff? And it's sort of a world that both uh, Mer Merlin Mann and Dan Benjamin are very immersed in and they're just sharing their thoughts on it and it's it's really good stuff. So any from that as a source, uh, you know, they mention these kind of tools incidentally all the time. Yeah. And uh, uh, one that I've been curious about because um, I love Evernote but it, it has its own format. Like uh, when when Evernote, I, if Evernote just had this more, because I code stuff too. When it's like I want to automate something or whatever, I want access to it. Evernote has an API, whatever. But I just wish it had an open file format. I just want to you know look at. I want to look at the text sometimes that it's capturing when I sh when I took a picture of a whiteboard or I took a picture of my notebook. I want access to that raw text, and that's that's not something that's just that easy or whatever. That and a few other things have me, you know, again, those tiny little frictions. Um, I, I, I got into trying out uh, um, notational velocity and actually through an app called NV Alt. Um, and so that, this is actually where I'm doing a lot of my notes, in which it essentially turns a folder into, um, uh, it, it'll very quickly and easily crank out text files and, and search the text files, both in the name and the content. And it, so it functions a lot like Evernote, except you're all in raw text. Okay. So it's helpful if you're, it, it has a uh, compounding effect if you're starting to use that to also draft blog articles and whatnot. And, you know, experimenting with stuff like Markdown and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid over there and, and trying <laughs> it out. So I like to try new stuff. Yeah, this Markdown stuff that I keep hearing about. Um, the uh, the Lean Into Art website interface, I noticed that when, when I type up blog posts that there's an option to do HTML, WYSIWYG, and then Markdown. So is this like taking hold, this new like coding language? Uh, or not coding language, but it's like a... a what, would, what would you call it? Uh, um, it is a... Um, it's a specific way of... Yeah, it's a simplified language, I would guess, or, or it's a... Uh, 
It's a pattern for making a text file. So it's very, uh, you, you can create a document in text. And so if you've ever, ever um, purchased software that comes with a readme file, or if you still download open source software from time to time, it almost always will have a readme file. And uh, they'll use things in text to enhance the formatting and readability, even though it's pure text. It's not like a rich uh, RTF format or a PDF that could have extra binary stuff and fonts and and size information. It, it gets rid of all that. It's not even like how HTML can do that in CSS and whatever in an open text format. It says, you know what? Very simple, simple um, he uh, headings, lists, paragraphs, or whatever. And it just reads like a basic text document. But you can transform that basic text document into other formats. So it, cr it becomes like a nice home base for your uh, for authoring posts especially so someone like me like a lot of times I'll, I'll be working on a post for like the Polytechnicast and, and coming up with show notes and if if you've let's see um, posterous is aust posterous I, I, I love their service but yeah. like I have had it where I'll get a browser crash and I'll lose my document there's yeah. no sense of a saved post or what have you and I could have invested sometimes maybe even like 20 minutes 40 minutes into this thing fetching it fetching links sharing you know titles and observations and whatever and boom gone so anyway then you think about well how can I write that somewhere else well maybe I'll write it in HTML tool or whatever markdown is a nice neutral zone to um, it's readable on its own and it transforms consistently into some clean HTML that you can ju then just paste into a like a CMS. Okay. Or you could turn it into um, any other format. There's, it's a very, it's a nice little home base. That uh, it, it's a different workflow for managing, composing text. Okay. That uh, so I if found. I raise, for, so if yeah. I open up my text editor. Because I, I I do the same thing. I, I have uh, I use a text editor called Smultron, which I I type my blog posts in first, and then copy and paste into the the CMS. Because yeah, a browser crash can happen, and I had that happen too often. When I'm three quarters of the way through, it didn't auto save, and I lost it. Yeah. Um, so I I could I could type this in the text document in Markdown, go into WordPress, choose HTML for the input field and just copy and paste and it will parse that into HTML? Is that what you're saying? Uh, you, you may need one more step that actually will transform that, then you paste the transformed result, which is HTML. Okay. Uh, so I actually uh, pair it with this application called uh, uh, Marked, which is available from the uh, I, app, iTunes App Store. And there's other apps that will do this. I mean, there is... Um, uh, free command line tools and, and all that stuff and, and depending on your OS like you could you could get it set up so you just uh, click a like the Apple services right button and uh, go into the services menu and have it automatically transform this text to and whatever there's other ways to do it it's it's getting integrated into more and more tools and it's kind of neutral as far as like a tool like NV alt but it's it's sort of a uh, NV Alt is a stepping stone toward having your data in a simple text format. And one way to then get more out of it is to start trying stuff like Markdown and whatnot. And uh, there you go. Okay. You may get more use out of it. So, um, yeah, anyway. I'm going into the App Store to look for marks now. <laughs> yeah, it's a... Uh, uh, yeah, I don't mean to, to say, oh, this is a perfect way. I'm, I'm exploring this workflow. So far, I'm liking it. Um, oh, yeah, and by the way, of course, I'm using a, a folder in Dropbox to sync my just simple current notebook, which is NVAlt, uh, among every device. So, like, um, Evernote is almost everywhere, and it's pretty good, but it's not as fast as just, just looking at a plain text file. So, oh, I mean, yeah. I've got, I've got a... Um, a, 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 um, what do you call it? Uh, a simple text editor that's Markdown aware called uh, Epistle. P Epistle? I don't know how to pronounce it. Yeah, E P I S T L E for my Android phone. Uh huh. And um, and then I'll use uh, 
uh, what do I use on iOS? Um, let me check. This, these are like the extra tools I wasn't planning on sharing or whatever, but uh, you know, good stuff. Um, so writing in Markdown right. is faster than writing in HTML. Is that what you're saying? Like, so you don't have to do yeah. like bracket a ref equals uh, quotation mark URL clo clo close quote close bracket name of the link <laughs> open bracket slash a close yeah, bracket. So link, let's see. Is there a good way, easy way to type in? Let's see. Let's see. Do 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 do. So if I click draw and then I've got the text tool, I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, see if I can do it here. Um, so if I wanted to do a link to um, lean into art, you would uh, put the two braces around it, and you say lean into art, and then the rest of the link could either be like if I wanted to do links in a, in no, the it's footer. Not, it's, it's not showing up. I'm not seeing your typing. Oh, okay, shoot. So I, I guess I would have to do this in stages. Like so, if I click away from it, does it show up? Oh, yep. There we go. Ah, uh, interesting. And now it's kind of hanging out in a bad spot. I'll start over. I'll do it up here. Um, so there's two ways to do it. You go lean into art, and then um, I could just put the link right there. I'll show you this in a second. Okay. Takes a. Um, oh, there we go. All right. And then the other way to do it. Then let's see. It's more of a footnote style. Uh, and I'm forgetting the syntax for it. <laughs> I think, all right, I think I got it. Hold on a sec. Um, that's where it helps if you're writing in a uh, Markdown Aware tool. I almost got this. Uh, okay, oops. And now I can make it appear in the podcast. So, okay. uh, and just to describe it for audio, um, you yeah, can. Yeah, I see what you're doing. Right. So if you have, uh, so you have a blog post with links, and sometimes maybe you'll uh, repeat the link, and so you could actually use a footnote syntax to just have that link appear in multiple spots. Uh, and it's pretty easy to type compared to a space href equals begin quote link name end quote you know, close the bracket. Type the you know etc. The type the visible text for the link. Close the a link. Anyway, um, it's just um, square brace. Na the the link. The hypertext. Close square brace. Open paren. Link. Close paren. Yep. And if you a lot less character typing. What's that? It's a lot less character typing. Yeah, way less. Um, so. <laughs> And sometimes you know, the time management and productivity, it comes down to this little weird flavor stuff where, yeah. you know what, if, this, if, this, if you groove on this, you're going to enjoy it and save some time. If you don't, then don't worry about it. Well, there's going to be a number of people who just use the rich text editor in their CMS, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's fine. Highlight it, hit the link button, enter the link, close the, you know, hit the done button, and now it's updated, right? So. Yep. And, uh, yeah, so it, it's an interesting different workflow. I'm trying it out. So far, I'm liking it a lot. Um, I'm yeah. using, yeah. Okay. NG well. Alt with Dropbox, and then, um, and actually, when I have, like, a big ed tool, uh, or a big, um, you know, like, a note to edit that is going to be in Markdown, I'll open it in TextMate. Okay. Um, because that gives me all the fancy highlighting of the, of the, of the text and whatnot, and a few cool uh, shortcuts um, as well. But uh, cool. Well, I'm gonna have. To, I, I noticed that Marked is a affordable three dollars and ninety nine cents in the App Store. So I'm gonna look more into this uh, Markdown stuff. Uh, yeah. So and then, as far as um, one thing that I that I do recommend is the. Um, you know, aside, set all these tools and stuff aside. Um, if you have, uh, except maybe a, like a spreadsheet. I th I, what I find really helpful, d just to sort of you know leave with this, which is what we kind of talked about in the beginning, is um, you know as far as um, this the stuff that I really wanted to cram in to try to share. Uh, estimation 
is kind of a pain if it's if it's very loose. If you don't have a feel for it, like one way to actually get a better feel for it is sort of divide up whatever you're about to tackle into those areas of concern. And so I'll do that in a spreadsheet and I'll give each area of concern a, a, an hour and then I'll add it up and I'll see, like, does that sound about right? And if it's something I'm familiar with, then I've got a good, uh, uh, I've got a good estimate in front of me. So if a client calls and says, I need, you know, to, you know, uh, to do this, you know, such and such kind of uh, comic or some kind of mini game to promote this product or whatever, I've got actually a few spreadsheets already, you know, that I've done that, that help me estimate. Mm. Um, and, uh, and what that does is uh, then I set it aside, I go about the project, and then I'll come back to it and see, um, see if how, how well I did. So, and not surprisingly, for things that I'm really familiar with, it, it's pretty darn good. But uh, for things that I'm like not, uh, not very familiar with, uh, you know, pretty far off. But it's at least something to help, uh, help with planning and estimation. Yeah, I think that's the hardest the hardest part of the whole deal, and that that comes from school hard knocks, right? Yep. Uh, but then it also like it, you can, it's it's a skill set that you can like sort of develop is how to learn to estimate something based on what you've done in the past. Well, again, that's school hard knocks. Knocks, but I, I'm I'm trying to save this real quick. I want to gr grab this for the show just to put up on the screen for people to see. Cool. Uh, let's see, emergent task planner. This is the thing I was I was talking about earlier from David C. This is a, this would be a tool to use uh, in helping to um, learn to uh, estimate your time. So let me stop sharing this and add it to the new one to the sharing so people can see it on the screen. Whoops! Not share my screen. I hit I, I clicked the wrong thing. <laughs> it has nothing to do with uh, the software. It has to do with the user. Here we go. It's uploading. Okay. Cool. So the, here we go. David Say, uh, writer, investigative designer. He has this thing called the Emergent Task Planner. And this is the thing where you come up with what's the three things you got to do. But then there's these units of time on there. And you can, it's not just about planning your day. It's about tracking your day and getting a sense of what these different tasks take, what, what, how much time these different tasks take. And this will be in the show notes as well. I'll link to this thing. The, this whole, like that? this is really cool. I have to check this out. And it reminds me a bit of, um, some of that uh, spreadsheeting that uh, yep. that I've done, um, which I had to go ahead. Sorry. Oh, um, this that spreadsheeting habit is actually um, it, it's been a fantastic communication tool, and it actually has gotten me in trouble a little bit at work from time to time. Um, you know, because when when you get really good at estimating, then you know how long things take, and then you can get really good at uh, reflecting uh, your your load as a resource. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, also, uh, then if you work on it even further, you can sort of, uh, I, uh, it, you can share that among your workers <laughs> <laughs> and whatnot. And uh, anyway, could lead to uh, some good conversations as far as resource management and uh, workload. Yep, I'm up, I'm uploading the instructions for the emergent task planner now. Here we go. Organizes your day as it happens. Step one, the beginning of the day, fill in today's day at the top of the form, and then the number of hours. If you're starting at 8 a.m., put an 8 in the top, blah, blah, blah. List your tasks. Write down three things. If you want to list more, you can do, list up to nine tasks. Don't strain yourself. You can optionally track time up to four hours using the 15-minute bubble. So, so he has it broken up 15-minute units. And then, wow. And the, the, he has this on a site for free. You just download it and print it out. It's a template that you can just use and make a notebook out of it. As the day goes on, use the notes area to jot down things you need to remember. You can also use this area to list more tasks or jot down reminders for tomorrow. This guy is obsessive, <laughs> but it's very cool resource. It is really cool. So something like this, like if, if it sounds like crazy or intimidating or whatever, but you're still curious, I mean, it's, it's worth jumping in. It's not like it's going to, you know, it's not like a bear trap. You're, you know, you don't have to amputate your leg. Yeah. But, um... It uh, it's it's a it's like a weird structured form of journaling. That's all. And, yeah. Uh, that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a strange form, but uh, but sometimes these forms are like a spreadsheet or whatever. It, it's a helpful um, 
it's a helpful way to bring measurable observations out of what you're trying to track. And, and, and that's the key, where it's like, okay, that's why it's better than maybe a moleskin if, for this case, or at least worth giving it a shot. And I'm not prescribing this. I actually might try, try this on myself, this emergent task planner, um, just because I'm curious. Yeah, me too. Uh, Anne's been using it, and she's, she says that it's uh, wonderful for helping to, you know, b b create order out of all the chaos that your day can easily become as more and more people throw things at you, so... And th this is a thing, though, too, that, um, like you mentioned, in how um, in your progression through um, getting really good at, at planning your workload with comics, um, I mean, you don't have to stick with this forever, right? Right, yeah. Training wheels. Yeah. It's yeah. fresh okay. perspective. Yeah, anyway. You know, I, I think the people, anybody listening to this knows that we wouldn't talk about something unless we thought it was good for for us and for others right you know but yeah i appreciate the fact that you're giving that little helpful nudge of like don't be scared it's cool you know um but yeah because we we did throw out a lot of looking at this diagram i'm like oh man <laughs> this wow like this it's kind of like you know wow his kung fu is way beyond my kung fu and I'm, I'm, <laughs> i <laughs> i don't know if i could you know survive a, a, a death match with this form but um <laughs> But I'm intrigued. Yeah, me too. Get on anyway. <laughs> it's not that bad. It just whatever. Yeah. Anyway, it, my reaction, I'm like, oh boy. If well, someone watching the video will probably see my eyes go. <laughs> 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 become saucers when evaluating these uh, these steps and whatnot. But it, it's cool. It's a good idea. It, and and it's it's just a list. It's just yeah. a list. Yeah. I mean it. I think of when I worked at, I used to, I've told this story before I know elsewhere, but uh, for anybody who's new to the show, uh, I used to work at a newspaper and one of my, like my job there was to work in the graphic design department and we were doing the ad design for like the weekly circulars, right? Like, so like the inserts that went in the newspaper with like the dining guide and like here's like all the different places where you can get your dry cleaning done and stuff like that. Mm. Um, so there were 13 pegs on the wall of all the different circulars we had to get through, and there was an in and an out. So like here's the, the in peg is where we hang the ads that need to be designed. Out is where we hang the finished ad printed out for the proofing department to get their hands on. Um, it was a really great visual for showing where we stand. If you were to put all those ads in a big pile, I mean, it was literally hundreds of ads that needed to be designed every week. You, if you just threw them in a big pile, it'd be like, ah, how are we going to get through this thing? But by putting them, arranging them by shopper and by setting deadlines for like, okay, well, we have to be halfway through this list of shoppers by Wednesday, you know, you had a really good sense visually where you stood on the week. And, well, I'm going to have to put in some extra hours tonight because we're, you know, it's Tuesday and we're only through the first peg. So little things like that. It's just a trick you plan yourself to make, to visualize what you're up against so you can uh, adjust your schedule accordingly. That's all it really is. That is cool. It's just a helpful feedback loop that yeah. isn't a, um, even when it's this kind of method with this much detail or like those pegs, it, it is a, uh, uh, it's not like this perfect promise of this is exactly how it's going to go. Um, oh yeah, like, like the, uh, the book Rework, um, they mentioned planning is guessing. Yeah. Um, and it is. It really is. It's not like, okay, good for you for being disciplined and having your spreadsheet and or your emergent task planner and you reflected for whatever and now you know really well, typically, given certain whatever, how, what, what it takes you to accomplish those tasks. But it's not some perfect promise and guarantee. And, you know, what was they say? Past performance doesn't, gar doesn't guarantee future results? Something mm. like that? It sounds. Uh, it sounds like something smart. It's a, it, either that or it's something like. It depends on the tone of voice you use. It could have been like a, an old boss did that, uh, explain that to me or something, and and maybe yeah. it wasn't a tone of voice. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, you know, it it's a uh, it's a helpful tool, and it's not uh, even like those pegs. W it sounds like a really cool feedback loop. So whatever is 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 um like I guess you could summarize all the stuff I've adopted. It's a helpful way to to um, to track and capture things and give myself that feedback loop that I find, you know, works for me. But I'm you know always looking to tweak it. I, I like how you said it's it's how you reminded us that planning is guessing. Yeah, like it, this is something that we it, it's an all too human trait to think that we can protect ourselves against the future, right? 
I just had a, a conversation on Twitter with somebody who was uh, – it's a young person. They're just starting out in the creative arts, and they're, and they're currently working a service job while they pursue the creative arts. A customer came in, said something to the effect of, um, oh, you're working the service job because you have a background in the creative arts. Like that's all you're suited for kind of idea. And it made this person feel bad, and I responded that, well, you know, people like to – uh, justify their choices that way by saying, like, look, I made the right choice. The future's scary, kid, and you've just made the wrong one. That's why you're serving me, the person who did it right, you know? That's part of it. But also it comes out of the sense of people are terrified of the future. They want to defend it. They want to insure against the future. And the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that you ultimately can't, but you can do your best guesses to optimize your situation in the future, right? But, yeah, those those hooks, those pegs in the graphic design department was no guarantee that by Friday we'd be on the 13th peg. There were plenty of Fridays where we were on the 10th peg or the 8th peg. And, yep, we're working late tonight to make this deadline. You know, it's just, it's, it's so... Uh, were your bosses, like, slow, uh, were, were they extending the pegs further out of the wall? Like, they put more <laughs> stuff on? No, it's, it, it seems like that sometimes. Okay. Uh, just wondering. But, no, there was just, there's... You know, there's always a problem accounts where they come back again and again with their pizza coupon. Like, could you make it just a little bit bolder, a little bit redder? Could you could you change? We decided to change the wording this time. You know, it, it design the same coupon clip out ad like 20 times. And like, really? You know, it's it's a coupon with a picture of a bad uh, character characterization of Tasmanian Devil because you wanted to avoid getting sued. Holding a pizza, saying "Crazy Pizza, five dollars <laughs> off." You're gonna sweat this. You're really going to sweat this. Okay. Uh, that'd be a fun coffee table book to, to make someday. Um, <laughs> All the terrible ads I designed? <laughs> the, well, yeah, exactly. The, the, the real work of Jersey Drozd. The, the whole thing collection. No, it did just the, the funny logo thing of, of the, um, someone working to make things different in seven ways or whatever that, yeah. that guideline is so you don't get sued. Yeah. But anyway. All right. Well, are, we need to uh, close this one. Are we? Are we yeah. at, at the end? Yeah, we've probably we've we've gone we've gone pretty long, but uh, I you know it was, I think it was worthwhile. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, you, people can always give us feedback. Like if if you know, hey, you know, Robin Jersey, if you guys should um, you know use the emergent task planner and have only like four bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> Four Bubbles is a good podcast. Five Bubbles, mm, you know, anyway. Yeah, they, they could let us know by emailing us at leanintoart at gmail.com, right? Yeah, Yeah, exactly. That's um, and, Or chatting us up on Twitter at, uh, at at Jersey or at Rob Stenzinger, another good place. Or at Lean Into Art as well. Um, we both oh, yeah. watched that. Um, but, yeah, it was, uh, it was fun chewing on that topic. And um, it's, uh, it, even though the, the, the future... It's not like you can you can you can guess at it whatever, but still it's helpful to get disciplined and, and uh, whatever works for you, kind of thing. It, it's it is useful. It's that weird. There there is no there's no pat answer. It's not even if there was, I would like I would try to avoid even saying it. Yeah. But like, um, I've had a lot of people argue against. Well, why do you think about this stuff so much? Whatever you overthink everything. And sure, yes, I do, but. You know, ask me but, questions on topics I've done that with, and uh, I probably have a decent answer. Rob overthinks it so you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Rob overthinks it and wants to have an overthinking party. So <laughs> <laughs> it's only fun if we're all overthinking. Oh, oh, see, I was trying to turn it into a service mark. <laughs> no, no. Uh, Okay, overthinking party, my place. Uh, we'll have ice cream cake, and we'll exactly. try not to get ice cream headaches because that'll stop us from overthinking. There you go. So. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> All right, so let's get out of here. So, uh, hey, everybody, if you're, there's, there's still time to sign up for 30 classes in 30 days. We won't belabor that point. Uh, a new uh, interactive online workshop every day for the, for the month of November. It's going to be really cool. Ten bucks a day. That's not... That, that, that's 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 a great deal, and uh, calendar is just about filled. We got one more spot to fill. I just talked to the person who's teaching the class. It sounds really exciting, and uh, we're going to be rolling out some interesting stuff in terms of um, 
some new challenges to run uh, for 30 classes in 30 days, which we'll make some noise about in probably in the next episode, so stay tuned. Mm -hmm. uh, but in, in the meantime, even if you can't participate, a great thing you could do to help us out if you enjoy the show, if you think this stuff was a good, uh, useful, or at least entertaining discussion, uh, or at least like mildly amusing, uh, you could tell a friend about what we're doing with Lean Into Art and say, hey, there's this thing, 30 classes, 30 days, maybe you want to check it out. Uh, you can hear Jersey talk about putting the thing in the thing. <laughs> That sounds cool. dirty. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> no, I was laughing. It's uh, the uh, it's a good story. Yeah, you should have should have your friends listen to it uh, to hear hear Jersey uh, tell that uh, in in his uh, his passionate, quick style. Um, also, uh, any kind of like good good podcast karma is, is very welcome. If you you know you have feedback and and questions for us, uh, you can you can do that by email or you can check us uh, check out the um, uh, contact f uh, form at Lean Into Art. It's a link in the footer. Um, or if you if you want, you could spread the word about the podcast via um, yeah. check us out in iTunes. Give us a rating. Give us That's a comment. That's the number one way to get uh, something seen by more people is to give it a little bit of a, just a little star rating you don't even have to write a full review just give it a star rating that r rises it up the ranks so that more people can find it when they search for art storytelling productivity podcast that kind of thing so yeah all of it's super super appreciated every little bit helps so yep. thank you everybody for downloading and listening and uh, for those of you who have uh, shown support gosh you guys are the greatest and uh, until next time fun talk Rob yeah, super fun, Jersey. All right, yeah, that means I've been Jersey Drozd of ComicsGreat.com, Jersey on Twitter. I am Rob Stenzinger of Interactive.